Counter Rev Audio. June, 2021. The End of Pax Americana by Kerry Bolton. June 13, 2021. Written for the UNS Review. This book is significant not only because of its detailed examination of globalization, unipolarity, multipolarity, and associated themes such as foreign policies, superpower rivalries, geopolitics and diverse branches such as the meaning of nationalism, and ethnos, but because it provides an insight into an important school of thought in Russia and further afield. Leonid Savin is a member of the Military Science Committee of the Russian Ministry of Defense, has served on the Faculty of Sociology at Moscow State University, is editor of Heopolitika.ru, editor of the Journal of Eurasian Affairs, director of the Foundation for Monitoring and Forecasting Development for Cultural Territorial Spaces, and lectures within Russia and outside. He is an organizer of the Eurasian Movement, and a leading advocate of the fourth political theory. Of the latter, the primary theorist is Dr. Alexander Dugin, whose influence as an advisor and scholar extends over military, academic, political, and governmental agencies in Russia, Europe, Asia, Latin America, and the Middle East. Eurasianism sees Russia as pivotal in forming a new geopolitical and civilizational bloc, halting the process of globalization driven by an Anglo-American axis that seeks world hegemony. In the new multipolar world envisaged by the fourth political theory vectors replace both pretty nationalism and globalism. Traditional Russian Outlook on Western Positivism and Universalism Given that there is much about Putin's foreign policies that show influences from the Euroasian doctrine, Ordo Pluriversalis reveals aspects of the ideological background that often informs official Russian attitudes. Indeed, Dugin has advised a range of personalities, including Putin, Communist Party leader Gennady Zyuganov, and flamboyant ultra-nationalist, Jiranovsky. Savin dedicates his book to the 100th anniversary of the publication of Europe and Mankind, by Nikolai Trubetskoy, 1890-1938. In 1920 Prince Trubetskoy identified cosmopolitanism as a facade for Romano-Germanic, Western, chauvinism. N. Trubetskoy, Europe, and Mankind, English translation by Alexander Trubetskoy, online, https colon slash 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 maps dot net slash docs, slash writings, slash Europe, and Mankind slash. What Trubetskoy saw in 1920 in cosmopolitanism as a facade for international domination by the West, is analogous to the present epoch of Atlanticism, or U.S. world hegemony in the name of liberalism and globalization. Trubetskoy states what is very close to what Eurasianists such as Dugin and Savin are reiterating. So the spreading of so-called European cosmopolitanism among non-Romano-Germanic peoples is purely a misunderstanding. Those who succumbed to the propaganda of Romano-Germanic chauvinists were misled by the words mankind, humanity, universal, civilization, world progress, and so on. All these words were understood literally, whereas in reality they concealed very specific and rather narrow ethnographic concepts. Trubetskoy, Ibid, Chapter, The Hypnotic Power of Cosmopolitism Mankind, Humanity, Universal, Civilization, World Progress these are the same slogans we hear today whenever globalization is imposed on a rogue state, whether by military invasion, financial credits, aid, trade, or color revolution. So we see that the first critique of globalization was based on cosmopolitanism, as Trubetskoy referred to it, insofar as globalization requires the leveling of all cultures and peoples in the name of the world shopping mall and the world factory. Liberalism still uses the same slogans of mankind, humanity, world progress, that provide the moral rationalization for bombing a state into submission where commerce and moral rot cannot sufficiently penetrate. Rise of Post-Cold War Multipolarity Savin examines a variety of advocates of unipolarity, and the unipolar world that appeared after the implosion of the Soviet bloc. The end of the Cold War era was supposed to usher the new American century, as one influential neocon think tank was called. 
various think tanks began looking at a number of scenarios, after it became apparent that U.S. global hegemony was not going to go unchallenged even with the demise of the USSR. In 2012 the U.S. National and Intelligence Council issued Global Trends 2030 which considered emerging conflicts in Asia, causing world economic dislocations, the possibility of a convergence of China with the USA and Europe, a fractured world where nation-states were supplanted by NGOs and world cities as power centers. The scenarios are not new. During the Nixon years there was a de facto agreement between the USA and China vis-à-vis -vis their common enemy, the USSR, and a Sino-US pact had been assiduously promoted for decades by Rockefeller and other plutocrats, as an adjunct to the trilateralist doctrine, USA-Europe-Japan. Problem of Populism for Unilateralists However while the rise of China, the resistance of Islam, and the sundry rogue states confronted unipolarity after the Soviet collapse, with Russia promptly overcoming the Yeltsin aberration, in some globalist quarters the chief challenge to unipolarity comes from within the USA. The danger of a breach between the foreign policies of the governing classes and the mass public, the danger of populism dash haunts the oligarchy. Robert Kagan, prominent among neocons, writing in The Jungle Grows Back, 2018, welcomes a fear of China as providing the necessary unifying focus that had been lacking since the end of the Cold War, but worries that peoples, plural, are reverting back to traditions, a process he blames on Trump. Another veteran neocon, Charles Krauthammer, wrote in 1990 in the unipolar moment that US hegemony would be achieved, yet predicted that it would only last a generation. He frankly stated that US actions in the Persian Gulf, and elsewhere were undertaken behind the facade of multilateral clothing, giving the appearance of international legitimacy, but that the world order would collapse. While Krauthammer refers to the USA creating world stability, and of remaking the international system based on domestic civil society, Savin questions this with the long record of American global adventurism. Krauthammer calls his new unilateralism realism, but also sees the main danger as being the USA's return to fortress America, or to multilateral institutions. It is America first non-interventionism that became resurgent, to a degree, with the Trump interregnum. What was so horrendous about Trump's foreign policy, that aligned neocons with street-rioting leftists, is that it returned to the doctrine urged by George Washington in his farewell address, 1796, that the USA cultivate neither friends or foes abroad. One of Trump's last speeches was to cadets at West Point, where he said that the USA should refrain from trying to police the world. The job of the American soldier is not to rebuild foreign nations, but defend, and defend strongly, our nation from foreign enemies. We are ending the era of endless wars. Donald Trump tells West Point cadets, we are not the policemen of the world, Telegraph, June 13, 2020, https colon slash slash www.telegraph.co.uk slash news slash 2020 slash 06 slash 13 slash Donald Trump tells West Point cadets not policemen world slash. So amidst the chaos of what some commentators have long called the new world disorder, Savin states that the task of those who reject globalization is to ensure a stable multipolarity. P. 44. The implosion of the Warsaw Pact caused a crisis in international relations. The Cold War between two great powers assured that the USA would be restrained. In the immediate aftermath of the Soviet collapse, such restraint was gone. The USA could act unilaterally. The USA expanded its influence into the former Warsaw Pact states and Russian territory with the use of color revolutions, whose supposed spontaneity was well planned and lavishly funded by Open Society, National Endowment for Democracy, NED, and many other parts of the so-called global civil society, which Russia was to blacklist and expel. China's Contribution to Multiplurality of the post-Cold War epoch, Savin sees several significant responses favoring multiplurality. He sees antecedents in Chinese foreign policy, including the 1954 Treaty with India, where territorial integrity, non-interference and coexistence were prescribed. 
Chinese scholars opined that the world would see one superpower and many strong powers. China indicated that it would assist Europe in becoming a pole. China sees itself as playing a role in Europe's economy and security. It might be asked, conversely, how far can China's economy be said to complement that of Europe, and will the EU become reliant on China as a pole? Does China see multipolarity as a phase in globalization with itself as leader, rather than as a bulwark against globalization? The joint declaration with Russia in 1997 on a multipolar world and the establishment of a new international order places China at the forefront of the multipolar project alongside Russia. This seeks a world system based on recognition of diverse paths for development, in contrast to the hegemonic and unilateral doctrine of neoliberalism. It was a response to the invasion of Iraq. Russian Policy in 2000 Russian foreign policy documents were referring to a multipolar system. In 2013 there was reference to a polycentric system, and international relations based on a regionalism of diverse interests, with regional currencies and trade pacts. That year a presidential decree referred to Russia as becoming one of the influential centers of a multipolar world. Despite frequent references in Russia declarations and studies to the projected new international order continuing to work within the system of the UN, Russia had no intention of subsuming itself to any such globalist enterprise. Rather, Russia insists on its interests in Europe, Middle East, Transcausia, Central Asia, and the Asia-Pacific region. It might be asked whether China and Russia will, rather, conflict in such regions. Significance of India India rightly plays a pivotal role in such a new dispensation. She is seen and sees herself as playing the role of a power in the Indian Ocean that might conflict or coexist with China and the USA. Savin refers to the territorial and civilizational disputes between China and India, but also considers that multipolarity might provide a new context for cooperation, especially if there are common interests in restraining a U.S. presence. One might expect the USA to try and confound any such Sino-Indian relationship, as it has unsuccessfully in regard to Russo-Indian friendship. Iran as a Geopolitical Pole Iran emerges as a geopolitical pole given its position between Central Asia and the Middle East, and its being the center of Shiite Islam. Iran's position of leadership has been impelled by its conflict with U.S. interests, seeking to expand in the region. Iran's consciousness of its position was indicated by President Hotami in 1999 in declaring 2000 and won the year of dialogue among civilizations as the counter to the unipolar doctrine of the clash of civilizations. Under the following presidency of Ahmadinejad Iran pursued friendship with Latin America, Russia, Africa and China, the latter sponsoring Iran's pursuit of membership in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Savin, p. 112. The Latin American Pivot Given that since the Monroe Doctrine the USA has considered Latin America its backyard, resistance to American imperialism has a long pedigree. This has taken the form of both far-left guerrilla movements and the rise of populists. Chavez was particularly important is assuming leadership of this trend, which ideologically rests on a new socialism that incorporates indigenous cultural identities intrinsically opposed to globalization processes. A proponent of Bolivarianism, the doctrine of a South American bloc, this has manifested in institutions such as the Union of South American Nations, UNASA, Community of Latin American and Caribbean States, and the initiative by Chavez and Castro in 2004, Bolivarian Alliance for the Peoples of Our America, ALBA. Of particular importance is that in 2011 Uruguayan President Pepe Mujica iterated the need to avoid ideological dogma, and transcend left, right, and center. What was Perón, for example, who remains such a pervasive influence, Chávez having called himself a Peronist? What of Vargas in Brazil, whose supposedly right-wing dictatorship is still remembered for its reforms among the industrial workers and peasantry. Both were advocates of a geopolitical bloc, as was Ibanez in Chile, although Vargas was stifled by internal opposition in pursuing this goal. 
Other pacts were signed by Peron with Ecuador and Nicaragua, but also stymied by internal opposition. Peron sidetracked the opposition from within by initiating a justicialist syndicalist Pan American Labor Union, Atlas, banned in 1955, after his ouster. Bolton, Peron, and Peronism, London, 2014, pages 182 to 188. Polycentricity and pluriversality. Mulitpolarity is synonymous with polycentricity, or many centers of polity which will comprise a pluriverse of interests, perspectives, values, where there are going to be at least several ethnic or religious groups within the same space. While Savin traces the concept back especially to Americans such as William James, it is to South American thinkers that we return. It is here that Western universalism attempted to impose itself on sundry indigenes, first as imperialism, then as globalization. Here there is much discussion in academia about many worlds, ways of being and of reality. Here spirituality remains a legitimate means of critique, beyond the positivism of the West. Savin cites academics referring to the continuing connection with the spirit world, where the natural, religious, spiritual, political, and social are not separate. Savin, p. 138. Savin shows by the example of Karl Schmitt, the German legal philosopher, that elements of the West are as relevant to the ushering of a new dispensation as any other remnant of tradition. Schmitt is quoted from a 1927 work that there is always a pluriverse of different peoples and states. The world is a pluriverse, not a universe. Rejecting the possibility of a world state and one humanity he saw such concepts as facades for imposing economic imperialism. A matter of time. Inherent in the globalist vision is the late Western perception of time being linear, with a focus on the present. The obsession with progress, while thinking only of the moment, has major impacts on ecology, economy and society. Here we see a gamut of ideas inherited from the Enlightenment, positivism, Darwinism, utilitarianism. The global managerial elite, has adopted late Western time and space perceptions, where the cliché holds good that time equals money, while to the Russian time is eternity, while India has a sense of timelessness, reflected in the vastness of the yugas of the Vedic literature, and China thinks in long durations. Savin points out the commonality of Marxism, and capitalism, the lineal ascent from primitive to modern, with a focus on the present, and detachment from the past. Citing the Weimar-era revolutionary conservative Arthur Mola van der Broek, epochs unfold as part of a chain of past, present and future which unlike the late West, expresses a chain of continuity and social holism. This is why conservatism creates value, while the late Western fixation with the present creates exploitation, Savin, p. 177, why ecological devastation in quest of instant profit is normal and necessary. Savin poses the question as to the position of the West in a future pluriverse. Can the West be saved, reset? Alternatives he lists are, 1, non-West, 2, anti-West, 3, new West, and, 4, East, and North and South, as a spatial, ideological concept. Because the fourth political theory is a conservative alternative, what Savin shows is that the left critique is flawed because the left itself derives from the same zeitgeist. Oswald Spengler said something similar a century ago when he stated that there is no so-called proletarian movement that does not operate in the interests of money, in his essay-slash-lecture on Prussian Socialism, 1919, in the decline of the West, and in the hour of decision. Enlightenment Spectre from the notion of time as lineal and therefore suggesting progress emerged the notion that some races are primitive and some advanced. Here the Western concept of race emerged, again from the Enlightenment. This notion of progress heralded the doctrine of the civilizing mission of the West, a notion that the USA assumed after Britain's imperial decay, and rationalized colonialism, the precursor of today's globalization. Enlightenment philosophers such as Adam Smith and Kant had written of racial hierarchies, and the necessity of development. 
we might recall that Rousseau held such notions, as did the Liberal Democrat, pro-Jacobin, slave-owning Francophile faction of the USA's founding fathers led by Thomas Jefferson. As did Karl Marx, whose dialectical materialism required the imposition of industrialization on primitives such as Indians, writing that whatever may have been the crimes of England she was the unconscious tool of history. Marx, The British Rule in India New York Daily Tribune, June 25, 1853 Without the laying of the material foundations of Western society in Asia, there could be no process leading to socialism. Marx, The Future Results of British Rule in India New York Daily Tribune, August 8, 1853 Character of Laws Globalism and unipolarity, or American hegemony, receives legal sanction by contrived notions of international law. With Savin's chapter on law and justice, p. 187, we come to the utilitarian methodology of imposing and expanding that hegemony. International law is expressed through institutions such as the Hague Tribunal and the London Court of Arbitration. Francis Fukuyama suggests an international network of institutions to enforce international law. International law justifies global interference including military invasion. The manner by which this serves vested interest might be seen by such examples as U.S. support for Kosovan independence, while rejecting the Crimean desire to return to Russia. The criteria for support or opposition rests with what serves globalist economics and geopolitics. Savin points out the manner by which the USA buys votes in the UN Security Council and General Assembly with offers of aid and loans, including support or otherwise for IMF loans. Again, international law proceeds from Enlightenment doctrine, including the social contract theory of Locke, Rousseau, and Kant. What we are seeing is the replacing of organic worldviews, whether in regard to time or law, with the inorganic and utilitarian. Savin mentions that the process was already emerging during the 16th century, where mercantile expansion was the forerunner of globalization, he alludes to Catholic theologian Francisco de Vittorio objecting, that there is no universal civil jurisdiction. Subsequent conservative critics in the West such as Joseph Demetra, and more recently Carl Schmitt, raised similar objections to universalism, contending that there are a multiplicity of localized worldviews, from which emerge laws according to unique circumstance. What has arisen over centuries of global mercantile expansion, once justified with religious morality, and now with international judicial concepts, has cynically in the name of human rights, become a universal leveling process. Security and Sovereignty, Shifting Definitions The intrusion of international law serves Pax Americana. From international law one proceeds to justifications for embargoes, sanctions and outright military invasion. The concepts of security and sovereignty are no longer defined according to local traditions, customs, and the ecological and historical experiences that go to form tribes, peoples, cultures, nations, and states. They are leveled to serve unilateral agendas. Because language is manipulated, Savin often uses etymology to discover the root of concepts. Hence, security has meant to the Greeks, to knock down, to the Romans, without worry, to the Russians, careful oversight, or vigil. We now have in the lexicon of statehood, failed states, fragile states, fractured states, restricted sovereignty. To the modern epoch collective security means what might be delivered to a rogue state or a failed state by NATO bombs, especially if that state includes a resource-rich region, such as Kosovo. U.S. backing for the 2014 coup in the Ukraine is regarded as a matter of self-determination, while Russia's support for Crimea is called expansionism. Other systems are at play, such as cyber warfare, and the intrusion of transnational corporations, NGOs, venture funds and rating agencies, the power of Big Pharma and Monsanto, regional alignments, the role of the U.S. dollar, and the granting or withholding of World Bank loans. Stuart Patrick suggests in Sovereign Wars, 2017, that the extension of global links will provide new opportunities for globalization. 
Indeed, it is readily ascertainable how NGOs and civil society have acted in tandem with the U.S. State Department, you said, NED, cyber giants, and many others to intrude on sovereignty. This has enabled the USA to become a hyper-sovereign power that extends an outreach globally, unrestrained by traditional concepts of security according to proximity. Savin also mentions Israel as hyper-sovereign in its occupation of territories from neighboring states, and the pseudo-sovereignty of Palestine. One might also add the hyper-sovereignty of Israel's worldwide network that encompasses diaspora jury, and sundry lobbies such as IPAC. Russia, and Hungary acted to remove this civil society due to its service to U.S. interests. While whole regions, state after state, have been brought into the orbit of Pax Americana U.S. officialdom alleges that Russia interferes in U.S. politics. Savin states that Russia, has sought to defend herself from this onslaught by establishing in 2017 the Temporary Commission for the Protection of State Sovereignty and the Prevention of Interference in the Domestic Affairs of the Russian Federation. Economics and Religion These two premise sovereignty, and security. As one might expect they are studied as separate entities today, where there has long been in Western academia, and further afield a lack of coherence in studies, and over-specialization that does not allow for a holistic education. But religion reflects the character of a people-culture nation-state, and economics is also as much diverse among the peoples of the world as religion. Again the theme is that there is no universal dash one size fits all dash categorization for the nebulous construct called humanity. Savin returns to etymology in seeking for the nature of the subject, economy equals homestead plus rule. Savin, p. 252. Economics expresses locality, although under globalization, the locality becomes universal. What remains of traditional religion conflicts with modern economics. For the West Protestantism had a primary impact on economy, and its predicate the medieval social ethos, i.e. Catholic. Savin states that Catholicism introduced a rationalistic element into medieval thought which allowed for the entry of capitalism. However Gothic Europe had for centuries lived according to an ethos that eschewed not only usury as sin, but mercantile competition. The economy was profoundly non-capitalist. In 325 AD the Council of Nicaea banned usury, interpreted as any profit from money, among clerics. Under Charlemagne the ban was extended to laymen. In 1139 the second Lotteron Council called usury theft. In 1311 the Council of Vienne declared usury a heresy. However, the Church often allowed Jews to practice usury, as did the Muslims, and prohibitions started to wax and wane. K. R. Bolton, Opposing the Money Lenders, London, 2016, pages 2-3. The Jewish role is considered in detail by Savin, drawing on the sociologist Werner Sombart, The Jews and Modern Capitalism, 1911, and sundry Jewish historians. More consideration could be given to the decisive Protestant role, although Savin does cite Max Weber, The Protestant Ethics and the Spirit of Capitalism, 1905. Although the Church was still in the 16th century resistant enough to try, unsuccessfully, to ban Melenius book treatise on contracts and usury, Henry VIII established a legal rate of usury, and the old prohibitions gradually went. Holland became the center of modern banking, from whence the Bank of England learnt its trade. The primary utilitarian philosophers Adam Smith, Jeremy Bentham, David Ricardo, and John Stuart Mill defended usury as legitimate contract. Bolton, opposing the money lenders, C.I.T. P. 4. Judaism, Catholicism, Islam. Savin states out that Judaism, unlike Christianity and Islam, is based around legalistic contracts with God. Savin, p. 256. Their continuing nomadism made them an international people that were ideally situated to be the middlemen of commerce across boundaries. This was the premise that Manasseh ben Israel, head of the Jewish community in Amsterdam, used in trying to persuade Oliver Cromwell to allow Jews readmittance to England. 
Manasseh ben Israel to Cromwell, 1655, in Paula Mendes Flaer and Jehuda Reinhotz, The Jews in the Modern World, Oxford, 1980, pages 9 to 12. Savin sees Catholicism as lacking in its response to the rise of international capitalism. However, he does accord credit to the encyclicals of Popes Leo XIII, Rerum Novarum, and Pius XI, Quadragesimo Anno, which offered an alternative to capitalism and socialism, both seen as godless. Savin accords even less cogency to the position of Russian orthodoxy to the problem, other than vague principles relating to commerce. Islam has had a robust outlook in condemning usury, riba, as sin and proclaiming the need for social justice in trade, but here too there are flaws. Savin cites Bicola's early Islam and the birth of capitalism, London, 2014. Economics has an inherently global character which Savin sees as only being avoidable by a totally closed economy such as the North Korean. He also averts to the problem of surplus production that has yet to be resolved, which Marx pointed out was an impelling factor that would internationalize trade beyond the boundaries of empires. An alternative that was found by Schumacher of small is beautiful fame was from Buddhist economics, which is also called the middle way, a sustainable economy, rather than a growth economy. The question is one that stands at the crux of opposition to globalization, but one that both right and left fail to address, the sovereign prerogative of the state to issue its own credit and currency, according to the productive capacity and needs of its people, without recourse to global financial speculators. That this can be done without any wizardry or miraculous intervention was shown during the 1930s by this reviewer's country of residence. K. R. Bolton, State Credit and Reconstruction, the first New Zealand Labour Government, International Journal of Social Economics, Volume 38, No. 1, January 2011, pages 39 to 49. That the present New Zealand Labour government does not have the foggiest idea of how to deal with the housing crisis is indicative of the woeful lack of today's economic understanding, which one might suspect is deliberate obfuscation cultivated by those who fund such institutions as the London School of Economics. However, the Russian Orthodox Church has made recent declarations on usury. Moreover there is a local currency called the Corleone that could provide a Russian example of what can be done on national and regional scales. Bolton, Koleonovo vs. Usury, a lesson for the world, heopolitica.ru, the 19th of May 2016, https colon slash slash www.heopolitica.ru slash n slash article slash Koleonovo v usury lesson world. Power and state. Economy, sovereignty, and religion are intrinsic to notions of state and power. In defining the many forms, Savin refers to Plato's types of power, which reflect the cyclical descent of a state from health to decay, from monarchy and aristocracy, to the tyranny of oligarchs and mobs. Latin Rex had legalistic implications, Persian Shah and Shah, King of Kings reflected the divine nexus typical of traditional societies, while to the Rus leadership derived from one who initiates a beginning, Savin, p. 287. Max Weber described three types of power in the modern epoch, rational-slash-legalistic, traditional, charismatic. To the conservative French thinker Joseph de Metra, power is predicated on something transcendent, whether religious or juridical. Heidegger, in referencing Nietzsche, saw power as mastering over something, including oneself. Acclaimed Persian Sunni scholar Al-Ghazali, 1058-1111, presented a similar outlook of self-mastery, the inner jihad of Muslim theology. The constant lesson from Savin, is that globalization means shifting definitions, and an attempt to set a universal standard. Hence the citizen, the subject of state and power, becomes the mobile and cosmopolitan consumer, rootless, as befits concomitant shifts in notions of territory and locality. Savin refers to the mall state, Savin, p. 303. The past epoch of imperialism saw the imposition of borders regardless of ethnicity. Savin refers to the fracture of the Kurds across several states, and to the Durand line between Afghanistan and Pakistan. 
The Middle Eastern states are composed of a colossal mess of map design by the Anglo-French that so disturbed T. Lawrence. The Versailles Treaty subjected Zuditan Germans to Czechs and provided Hitler with the justification for expansion eastward. The demands for a greater Albania were the means by which Kovaso was detached from Serbia. Many other inorganic and ahistoric borders provide propagandistic justifications for U.S. slash NATO slash UNO intervention. Ethnoi, Peoples, Nations The natures of ethnoi, peoples, and nations are being redefined with the goal of obliteration into a vortex of monoculture, where a mass of drones is administered by a managerial class. Concepts of nationality include the German Volk, and the Deutsches Volkstum of Friedrich Jan, 1815, defining individuals united into an identity. Jacobinism and liberalism played an important role in defining nationalism and people as a means of rebellion against the traditional dynastic and imperial orders, uniting individuals by means of social contract and constitutions rather than through the nexus of divine rulership. For Herner nations are born from time and place, and each nation has its own character. The Romantic movement referred to a common spirit of past, present and future. Max Weber saw the nation as a specific sentiment of solidarity in the face of other groups, and he wrote of a people's values. Weber Economics and Society, Volume 2, p. 922. There were and remain theories that both affirm and reject the necessity of attaching nation to state. For Margaret Canavan Nationhood reflects solidarity and feeling, nationhood and political theory, 1996, p. 69. Savin traces the Russian school of ethnology to Sergei Shiro Kogorov, who defined an ethnos as a group of people who speaks the same language, recognizes their common origin, and has a set of customs and lifestyles which are preserved and sanctified by traditions which differ from the customs of other groups. Savin, p. 323. During the Soviet era ethnos was defined by Yulian Bromley as a stable group in a definite territory, with common and stable particularities of language, culture and psyche, conscious of their unity and difference from others. He stated that language and religion were not definitive criteria for an ethnos. Savin alludes to Russian Eurasianists as referring to multi-ethnic nationalism, based on historic destiny, rather than ethnicity, language or religion. Savin, p. 343. Savin sees the denial of ethnic differences as part of modernism, and postmodernism. He alludes to constructivism as the postmodern contention that ethnos is a creation of power elites. Savin, p. 328. Professor Alexander Wolfhasia sees modern nations as bio-cultural residues, from the overthrown traditional order, where the bourgeois replaces the dynastic rulers. The Sword of Tradition and the Origin of the Great War, 2018, p. 271. As Marx predicted, this bourgeois ruling class would become international. Cayley and T.F. in the 19th century saw modern nationalism as a means of cosmopolitan democratization. National policy as a tool of world revolution. There arose a chauvinistic aggressive nationalism that provided ideological impetus for imperialism and colonialism, in pursuit of markets and resources, the forerunner of globalization. Beyond Western concepts, Savin examines the Arab, where nation has been defined as a community of people, bound together by a commonality of race, language, homeland, and laws, Abd al-Rahman al-Kawakibi. Ibn Khaldun referred to the spirit of solidarity, Asabia, where language played the predominant role. In our time, the Grand Mufti of Moscow, Argenetdin defines nation as a spiritual kinship with language and territorial bonds. Savin, p. 346. Indian nationalism was not constituted until the 19th century as a doctrine. Gandhi equated nation with self-governance. A. Gauss saw nationalism as a divine force, as God manifesting himself. D. Savarka was influenced by 19th-century Western Indology, referring to communalism, territory, blood, Aryan, Sanskrit, and Hinduism. 
strategic cultures and civilizations. While nations have fixed territories, a people, singular, does not. National borders, frequently do not correspond with ethnic divisions. There might be successful sub-nations existing within a supranation, or imperial edifice where the monarch is the unifying factor, confederations, or state-imposed edifices. Savin uses the example of the Quechua Indians spread over a large number of states in Latin America. The term strategic cultures was coined by Jack Snyder in 1977 to analyze the impact of cultures on international relations and military conflicts. However the antecedents go back to Sun Tzu, and Thucydides, Savin, p. 358. During the 19th century concepts such as folk psyche and folk spirit anticipated ethnopsychology. Savin gives a recent example of Ruth Benedict's study on Japanese ethnopsychology produced during World War II, The Chrysanthemum and the Sword. Benedict and other social scientists, despite their generally leftist persuasion, played a major role during the Cold War is supplying ethnographic studies for the USA, including the CIA. Through the Asia Foundation, for example, the CIA created part of a widespread pattern linking hundreds of anthropologists and other regional specialists with Cold War intelligence agencies. Catherine Verdery, The CIA is not a trope, How, Journal of Ethnographic Theory, 2016, Volume 6, Number 2, p. 447. Options The social scientists employed by the CIA, working in tandem with Rockefeller, Ford, Carnegie and other oligarchic funds, analyze and categorize peoples and cultures according to how they might be subsumed by globalization. Scholars from outside the West assert the recognition rather than the obliteration of diversity. Muslim scholars assert a dichotomy, there is Islam, and there is the West and its surrogates in which money predominates. Abdul Rahman states that there can be no dialogue of civilizations, because of the hegemonic nature of the West, but states that there needs to be dialogue that maintains a balance of power of different civilizational blocks. Savin, p. 379. Russian Eurasianists in emigration, such as Cage Kides, criticizing the flawed character of the League of Nations, seen as trying to implement a universal state, advocated continental states, which took account of racial psyche, cultural heritage, and a common recognition of historical tasks. These geopolitical blocks might include Pan-Islam, Pan-Europe, Pan-America, Pan-Asia, and Russia-Eurasia. These ideas probably influenced Karl Haushofer, the German geopolitical theorist, whose doctrine in turn has influenced current Russian thinkers. Savin, p. 390. Samuel Huntington politicized the concept of civilization in Clash of Civilizations, Remaking a World Order, 1996. Here we see civilization blocks in intrinsic conflict as they pursue or resist hegemony. Globalist hegemony receives coherent opposition perhaps most of all from Shiite Islam and Russia. However, Dugin offers an ideology and implicit strategies intended to be broad enough to be adapted across the world, a type of global anti-globalization. Dugin in The Theory of the Multipolar World, 2012, credits Huntington with coming closest to conceptualizing the pole as the basis for a pluriversal system of international relations. While Dugin is the most widely known and influential of the present Eurasianists, he is part of a geopolitical tradition in Russia, the founding father being Petr Savitsky whose concept of mestortasvity, place development, refers to the emergence of blocks as totalities comprising geographic, ethnic, economic, historical, and other factors. Savin, p. 392. Ethnography has been an important factor. Lev Gumilev with his Ethnogenesis and the Biosphere of the Earth, 2012, has provided a fascinating hypothesis on the emergence of ethnoi and the role of geography. From Germany the geopolitical theorist Karl Schmidt, large spaces, provided important input. In concluding his consideration of civilization Savin states that etymologically it implies a process. He refers to Norbert Elias, the civilizing process, Basel, 1939, 
in stating that globalization is one such civilizational process. Alternatives? International politics is seen as a Western invention, which draws significant support from westernized elites from the former colonies. One can point to organizations such as the African American Institute as having selected and trained political, technocratic and managerial classes to assume leadership of the former African colonies, replacing the departing colonial civil servants with the new servants of U.S. neo-imperialism, and the World Bank. Savin draws on anti-colonialist thinkers such as Franz Fanon, Black Skin, White Masks, but given the rootlessness of the managerial and technocratic classes being shaped by globalization into what G. Pascal Zachary has approvingly called the global me perhaps maintaining reference to a white ruling class is passé, and obscures the depth of globalization as a coagulating process of all ethnicities and cultures. We might also note that black and brown cultures that have been reshaped by postmodernism into subcultures such as hip-hop are used as a means of co-opting youth in the process of globalization, as shown in the Rifkin Memorandum, Charles Rifkin, Minority Engagement Report, U.S. Embassy, Paris, 2010. However, there are scholars within Western academia, who provide depth critiques of globalization and its Enlightenment origins, including its implications for ethnocultural identity. John Gray in Enlightenment's Wake, Politics and Culture at the Close of the Modern Age, 1995, perceives both liberalism and Marxism as belonging to secularist, rationalist, and humanist world historical failure, Gray, p. 98, 7, 400. The implications of ecology are also identity-based, what are nations and geopolitical blocks other than the ecosystems of ethnoi from whence they are birthed, developed and sustained. Savin cites Jacob von Uxkel, founder of ecology, as stating that a unitary world does not exist. Italian philosopher Giorgio Agamben asserts, every environment is a closed unity, the open, man and animal, 2003, pages 40-41, Savin, p. 401, a direct philosophical challenge to the open society of Karl Popper and his protégé George Soros, but a challenge that does not seem to deter green politics from embracing globalist agendas. Chinese model. In tracing the origins of a non-Western approach to international relations, Savin cites the publication of the paper by A. Ocharya and B. Buzan in 2010, Non-Western International Relations Theory, in Perspectives on and Beyond Asia. Savin gives first place for such perspectives to the Chinese school. However, he also cites Ye Qin who contends that there is no Chinese school. The main ideas have been taken from the West, and remain premised on the ancient tributary system, which subordinates others to the Chinese pole. Qing, why is there no Chinese international relations theory? In Non-Western International Relations Theory, 2010, pages 29-31, Savin, p. 410. Savin contends that the Chinese school is based on the 3G model, great learning, global vision, grand harmony, premised on Confucian doctrine. Hindu and Muslim. Acharya, Op. Sati, advocates for an Indian approach to international relations based on religious tradition. Savin mentions Swiraj, self-government, and Swadeshi, self-sufficiency, as principles still widely employed in India. Savin, p. 413. India remains pivotal to any resistance to globalization in this reviewer's opinion. Bolton, Geopolitics of the Indo-Pacific, 2013. Islamic theory is based on a dichotomy of Muslim and non-Muslim states. Savin, p. 414. This religious dichotomy is portrayed by globalist propagandists in asserting the inevitability of the clash of civilizations. However, history has shown both epochs of conflict and of accord between Islam and the West. The situation is dialectically exploited by the USA's support for Wahhabist states, while duplicitously claiming to lead a war on terrorism as a primary method of imposing Pax Americana. Bolton, Zionism, Islam and the West, 2014. Sustainability. 
The fourth political theory attempts to provide a coherent philosophy on which to premise alternatives to globalization and the Pax Americana that is premised on what are seen as passé liberal enlightenment dogmas from the late West. The fourth political theory is intrinsically conservative, defined as being cognizant of the importance of traditions and therefore of differences. It also inherently rejects the notion of positivism, and the lineal approach to history as progress. This conservative rejection of positivism and the concomitant industrialism that was applauded as much by Marx as by the Manchester School, has brought us to treadmill economics that has encroached upon most of the world, i.e. globalization and what Marx predicted, approvingly, as the internationalizes tendency of capitalist production. To this, Savin posits sustainable development. While this is a name of the UN the institution is itself a product of positivist, enlightenment notions of humanity. The nations that comprise much of the UNO are still firmly embedded in various stages of capitalism, including those that are described as socialist. Certain Muslim and Latin socialist states, such as Cuba and Iran, are exceptions. Few function outside the orbit of the World Bank for example. Hence the neglect of environment, Savin, p. 420, and lack of an ecological perspective, that includes human cultures as constituents of unique ecosystems. Dozine. In looking for antecedents to the fourth political theory, Professor Martin Heidegger plays an important role. Savin, p. 421. The Heideggerian concept, Dozine, can be seen as in accord with Houdi, and its analogous concepts in East and West. Here Dozine means a state of authentic being, where one exists between past and present, the underlying notion of the eternal, and the nexus between man and divinity. Alexander Dugin asks, can one speak of a specific Russian Dozine? Savin P. 425. Every civilization has its own concept of Dozine. For Russia, it is centered on Orthodox Christianity and Eurasianism, tradition, and the coming into being. Savin quotes Heidegger on an historical people's metaphysics manifesting as metapolitics. Dozine requires a process of rediscovering for those living within postmodernism. Savin gives examples of the influence of Heidegger, throughout Latin America, among Muslim scholars, Japanese, Kyoto school, the Buddhist equivalence of Dozine, true being, and Korea. Heidegger is a bridge between East and West, between abstract contemplation and rigid rationalism. Savin, p. 427. Multipolar Praxis There is increasing discussion on multipolar principles implicit in multilog and polylog, where even Western scholars and diplomats are searching for alternatives to unipolarity. New alliances are being considered at different levels. Mohammed Samir Hassan, University of Pune, sees a commonality between Germany and India in opposing unipolarity. In Germany, scholarly and diplomatic quarters are discussing the concept of anchor countries, German Development Institute, 2004, Savin, p. 433, the equivalent to Dugin's poles, around which regional blocks might form. The European Union has potential for what high-level thinkers are calling strategic autonomy. Defy it, strategic autonomy towards European sovereignty in defense. EU Institute for Security Studies, November 2018, Savin, p. 437. In particular doctrines on European continental defense, such as the European Defense Fund, are forming outside NATO. Savin suggests that the EU might become another West, while there is discussion on the EU becoming another pole in a multipolar world. Savin, p. 438. Russia stands between East and West. Russia's role with that of Germany is being widely recognized as such among strategists in both Russia and the EU although Savin has discounted Spengler, like Moller and other Weimar-era conservatives. Spengler saw Germany's future being aligned with that of Russia as the successor to the West on the world stage. Spengler, The Two Faces of Russia and Germany's Eastern Problems, 1922, 
in Prussian Socialism and Other Essays, London, 2018, pages 111 to 125. Against Colossi. What structural forms might a multipolar world take? With talk of geopolitical and regional blocks, the impression might easily be of cumbersome bureaucratic entities obliterating local identities and imposing downward structures. However, the raison d'etre of the Eurasianist doctrine is to offer an alternative to the global uniformity, to maintain or restore every authentic identity. Fourth political theory suggests geopolitical blocks as confederations of small entities. This is contrary to the late West's conception of the banality of multiculturalism, Savin, p. 449, which serves to fracture and reintegrate national and cultural entities around a money nexus. What Eurasianism suggests is along the model of the Swiss Confederation, where 22 regions form an organic totality. Savin draws on the works of German thinker Leopold Kor, who rejected the nebulousness of humanity in favor of identities that would replace the artificial borders of nation-states, modernist liberal constructs, yet so beloved by the nationalist right, the bourgeois spirit as Savin calls it, Savin, p. 446. The goal is, Savin concludes, a pluriversal, harmonious order of a complex of polycentric system of systems.